I just wanted that little bit of just a little taste before the robots can't catch that one. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to Bevan, a femme over 40 and her friends podcast. I'm your host, Bevan. I've said my name three times. It's time to start the show. I don't know if I said the third time. I'm getting not as good at that intro as I once was. So maybe it's time for a new intro. Um, but I'm excited to be here. My co-host Biscuit Reynolds is taking a nap on the bed. Uh, he was just diagnosed with being actually fully blind <laughs> and a little bit of uh, high blood pressure and perhaps idiopathic hypercalcemia. Um, so we'll find out. Uh, loving an aging senior cat slash pet is um, a challenge that I have done before. And I love my little familiar and I'm glad that he's part of this podcast. But my neighbor made an amazing portrait of him. And so it lords over all the podcast episodes. Um, also, this is uh, my bestie, Rachel, who is also a Taurus. My guest today is a Taurus. Uh, but my bestie, Rachel, um, cross-stitched this little, she says it's a Kermit Charming for her love, Bevan, which is me. And my love story with Rachel is one of my favorites. Um, date your friends, romance your besties. Like we are in relationship with everyone in our life and uh, romantic relationships only being for the people we're physically attracted to are not the deal in the age of Aquarius. We are really meant to love up our people in such beautiful ways. And I'm so excited for you to meet Jana. She is like a new obsession of mine. Like I have a lot of psychic friends and I love it and I want more. And um, she is just, she blew me away actually. We met because she went to astrology school with my friend Drea and Drea invited her six months ago during Libra season to do a group Akashic Records reading for uh, my community, the Glowing Goddess Sisterhood. And it was a really powerful reading. Like we kind of thought we were going in there for a reading like collectively for ourselves, but it really turned into a reading for our community. And we got a really, a, a lot of really good information, a lot of healing information about our community. And I was just hooked. Like I was like, I want to know everything about Jana. And so like started following her. I joined her discord. Um, I've gotten a couple of readings from her and they were incredible. So I'm really excited for you to get to know Jana. Uh, we talk a lot about chart stuff, like astrology charts. So if you want to learn yourself a little better, I like astrology first and foremost to understand me in the world better, but I also love astrology for understanding the people I love better and how to love them better, because that's one of the best things you can do is just kind of get someone's chart information. <laughs> Outside of this podcast recording, Jana was like, yeah, once you give me your birth information, I can see a map of your soul. I don't know if you want to give out that information like that, but I like it. I mean, I won't even consider dating someone until I've looked at their chart. And there are certain people, including Taylor, Allison Swift, who I would date intentionally just because of their chart. Like, I love her art too. That's, I think, also part of why I, I just adore Taylor Swift. But um, it really is like her chart is so fascinating to me. And I think we'd have great chemistry. Um, just based on the chart, but Taylor, Allison Swift, if you are watching this or listening to this, call me, email me fatkiddanceparty at gmail.com. Uh, the best way to support this podcast, by the way, if you value my work in the world at all is my Patreon page, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is a membership support site. Um, it allows folks like you to support creators like me who make work that you love and value in the world. Um, Patreon, has, is a private secure site, state-of-the-art security. Um, they do all the banking and stuff. And so I just get a direct deposit every month. It makes it so easy for me. And I'm so grateful for Patreon as a platform. The membership benefits I offer starting at seven bucks a month, you get access to all of my Zoom aerobics classes. I teach a class called Fat Kid Dance Party Aerobics. Uh, it's for anyone who has ever felt left behind by mainstream fitness. If you've ever been called too much, too fat or felt too awkward to dance, mine is the supportive class for you. You truly cannot get it wrong. It is so much fun. And the community that we have created on Zoom is my pride and joy. I love it. I love getting to witness um, self-care wins by, by, we always check in after class about our self-care wins. And I love getting to watch people grow and choose to care for themselves in a world that really profits off of your self-loathing. It's a revolutionary act to care for yourself. Um, I offer a $25 a month level that gets you access to on-demand classes. Um, I teach uh, aerobics uh, very passionately, and I think I have figured some stuff out. In the last 20-something years, I've been working really hard to love my body in a world that is incredibly fatphobic and incredibly um, toxic about beauty ideals. Um, I have survived and recovered from a lot of ways in which that 
that was toxic to me. And I figured some stuff out. And I talked about this in the podcast, but I'll say it now, uh, is that it takes only 20 repetitions to learn something when you use play, but it takes 400 when you're not using play. So just remember, like I'm trying to help you get the shortcuts. So come work out with me and get some shortcuts to loving yourself and regarding your body with love and grace and care, um, because that's really what it deserves. It's the only one you're ever going to have. You don't get to have another one in this lifetime. So spending your life battling your body is a waste of your time and it distracts you from toppling the patriarchy, which is really what we're here to do. We're here for the divine feminine rising to find our joy. And um, I mean, even just the focus on your joy is something that we're not taught how to do. So I hope that you'll find value in that. It's patreon.com slash FKDP. And if you're spiritual like me and Jana, I also teach spiritual self-care lessons in that Patreon, um, specifically just to help you learn how to, you know, what I do as part of my spiritual practice is literally just stuff I've figured out over the last, I started getting spiritual 13 years ago. So like over the last 13 years, what I've put together, um, and now I'm a very spiritual person and my life is uplifted and made better because of my relationship with God and the goddess and all of that. And so um, I want to inspire you to create your practice, basically. So that's all available. Patreon.com slash FKDP. The link is in the show notes. Um, I hope you'll join me there. And I hope you'll like and subscribe and follow and rate and review and say all the the benevolent, generous things if you have them to say, because creators like us are just kind of creating into the void and hoping it makes a difference in the world. And so it does make a difference when you interact with us and you support us. And I could not be doing this work and I could not be creating this podcast if I didn't have Patreon supporters like helping me make this my job. So thank you. Appreciate you. And on with the show. Dana, welcome to the podcast. Hi. I'm so Jana, excited you're here. Yay. I'm excited you're here too. Um, okay. So Jana, let's start with your big three um and okay. then tell us about I always do business in the front on the podcast so then tell us about who you are and what you offer okay so I am a Taurus sun a Leo moon and a Taurus rising because I have the double I like to also throw in that my chart ruler is my Venus and Pisces and that's significant to me and very close to my heart um in terms of what I do, so I'm an astrologer. I practice both humanistic and evolutionary astrology. So it's sort of like the more psychology centered astrology. And then evolutionary is more of like the study of the soul and karma uh, as, as you can see it through the, the birth chart. Um, so I, on top of astrology, I work with the Akashic records and I'm also a tarot reader. The three are not like distinct from one another. They very much overlap. I'm often like pulling in one system and kind of weaving them together. And that's where I kind of find the sweet spot. Um, what else? What else did you ask me? Who I am, what I do. Tell us about and... how people can work one-on-one -on -one with you. Okay. So I offer astrology natal chart readings through kind of both the humanistic and also the evolutionary lens. They're very fun. Um, I'm a very Plutonian person, so I love to go deep. I love to kind of do deep soul dive discoveries, and that's my forte. I love to discuss trauma. I love to discuss kind of the, the deep workings of the soul and the mind and um, do have like a, you know, an informal background in psychology. And I'm certified in somatic parts work, which is basically a therapeutic approach that is focused on kind of reuniting the parts of ourselves that operate below the surface, what we might call like our sub personalities, um, also known as internal family systems or IFS. And so I, I think as a Taurus and as a heavily Plutonian Taurus, focusing kind of on how we can heal our inner worlds through connection to the body through reconnecting the body and the spirit and um, really reconnecting to our pleasure is, is kind of my philosophy and approach. Very heart-centered, very compassionate, but also very honest. And my kind of guiding principle is compassion, liberation, and allowing ourselves to come back to self and to come back to earth and community. So 
That's my vision. You're so good at it. Um, I also want to shout out um, that you do uh, audio readings where you can send a recording, mm -hmm. which um, I've had two now that you've gifted me when I won and one you gifted me when I was going through a hard time. And I appreciated both of them so much. I've listened to them both multiple times. Um, and it's helpful. So it's like you just like sometimes when I get a reading and I'm on Zoom, we're chatting so much that like you don't go as deep as you could if you were just stream of consciousness, like reading, 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 and like that. Yeah, it's helpful. So, but then you also offer live readings for those people who want to have the chatty experience. Um, and yeah. your Discord is popping. Like you have an amazing Patreon with Discord. <laughs> Plutonian people and there's so much in there you're doing like a confidence challenge right now and you did a couple months ago you went through all the tarot with the major arcana I think yeah so you offer yeah, a lot yeah. Your it's been very down. fun huh thank you yeah I really appreciate that yeah it's thanks for mentioning that I kind of forgot a lot of pieces but the Plutonian people the discord that we began last year has been really fun it's it's a free space just for people to come and kind of explore their Pluto probs. And um, it's very intimate. It's it's a really loving space and people who have a lot of courage and, and really bring themselves. So yeah, that's a free resource if anyone wants to join. And, um, and I love doing recorded readings. It's fun for me because I am a 12th house person. I channel best when I'm sort of in silence. So um, but I appreciate that a lot of people like to chat and like the conversational elements of reading. So yeah, wow. each their own. It's so good. And the group work, like you offer, you curate other people coming in and teaching your crew. Um, what was the one I just did? Um, oh my God, the shame when Saturn went into Pisces um, and yeah. Pluto went into Aquarius, you hosted that So Pisces doing a shame hypnosis workshop, which was just like so clutch and yeah. some big healing I was doing and really grateful for that. That was, that was a resource. That was amazing. So. That was so powerful. Yeah. Taylor Ursula, incredible astrologer, hypnotist. Um, yeah, I love, I mean, I, I'm obsessed with the people that I'm connected with. Like I, I you know, in this moment of time, I feel just in, incredibly overwhelmed by the magic and the beauty of the people around me. And it's been really a gift to be able to introduce people, to connect to, to connect people with one another, and also to bring people in to share with the community who they might not otherwise be exposed to. So it's like, I don't know, I'm an 11th house Venus, and I that's where I find my love. That's where my heart lives is, is with my community. So yeah, it's cool to embody your chart and learn more about it in just making conscious choices and then be like, Oh, that's how that works. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you, I mean, I, I also am obsessed with the people in my life and like how these cosmic connections come through at just the right time to teach you what you need to know about yourself um to embody yeah. your chart more and embody why you were born to be here at this time right this wacky wacky time um and you talked about being obsessed with like Lilith in the chart and like Lilith aspects and like you mm -hmm. talking about my 11th house Leo Jupiter with Lilith like one degree away which I think really yeah. all these women <laughs> women's communities I keep being in and being part of and being in leadership for so uh yeah it's it's pretty amazing um also we you since you've been throwing Pluto around a little bit will you just teach a little on like what does Pluto mean and what do you mean when you say Plutonian yeah sure um so Pluto is you know technically a dwarf planet it was demoted by NASA like and I think that man, that gives a lot some of people man try to decide something like that yeah yeah some dudes <laughs> uh but it like I mean, I, it's funny to say I'm obsessed with Pluto because Pluto is actually the planet of obsession. Pluto is the planet that brings us into both our shadow selves, that brings us into our power, uh, the sort of like keywords that we might think of when talking about Pluto are death and rebirth, transformation, trauma, power and power struggles, and 
where Pluto lives in our chart can tell us a lot, not just about the sort of pain and the struggle and the transformative experiences that we go through in this lifetime, but it can also tell us a lot about the generational experiences, the generational trauma that we inherit. Um, and also if you're a believer in past lives, it can tell us a lot, a lot, a lot about our soul's sort of echo in this lifetime and the experiences that the soul has been through in previous lifetimes that have kind of created the patterns, the karmic patterns that we're working with. Um, yeah, so it's a real like underpinning of evolutionary astrology, which is the facet of astrology that I currently am focused on. And there's so much to glean. Okay. Will you give us a like hot, uh, a hot moment about Pluto and Libra and Pluto and Scorpio? Cause those are the two main yeah. that listen to my podcast. I see my stats. I know who's listening, but hi. To yeah. Anybody. Great question. Um, yeah. So Pluto and Libra, um, the generation that came before the millennials, I guess it would be generation X. Is that it's, it? It's gen X and Zennial. Cause technically I get to be a Zennial. So. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So Pluto and Libra is kind of exploring the way that power dynamics and loss of self can occur in relationship. <laughs> and so it's, <laughs> so it's wow. like, not to, just, to put it lightly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when you think of Libra as an archetype, it relates so much to relationship and to partnership and, and to the people, the way that we mirror one another in relationships. And then when we think about Pluto and Libra and bringing the energy of power and transformation into that archetype, we're thinking about the way that we both transform in relationships, but also the way that we can give away our power in relationships. And so it's very like packed in with our early programming and the way that we related to our caregivers. And for Pluto and Libra people, a lot of folks are trying to discover a true sense of self that can stand alone and kind of stand outside of relationship and still identify themselves and say, this is who I am bringing in that polarity of the Aries energy, which is like, I am, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is how I express myself. Very sort of I centered, um, and finding the, the sort of like sacred balance between those two, between self and the other, um, and then Pluto and Scorpio, on the other hand, there's like kind of a joke in the astrology community because Pluto has different lengths of transits. It spends a different amount of time in each of the signs because of the nature of its orb, um, which is like an ellipse, a ellipsic. What am I trying to say? It's elliptical. Mm -hmm. So it goes around the curve here and it kind of like goes quick. And then it spends more time in these signs. And Scorpio is the sign that it spends the least amount of time in. And the joke in the astro community is that like, if it spent any more time in Scorpio, like no one would make it out alive. Um, so there's like an inherent deep in intensity that comes through with Pluto and Pluto and Scorpio, um, also known as millennials. And so with Millennials and Pluto and Scorpio folks were really exploring what power means inherently. It's like the deep study of power itself. Um, so similar to Pluto and Libra, there's this kind of like exploration and journey with giving away our power to other people, to people in authority, to people in relationship. Um, but it kind of brings in this like depth of shadow work that I think a lot of millennials are really familiar with, whether it's by choice or not, we're sort of brought into our shadows constantly. And, um, and because Scorpio is a fixed sign that fixed water, you know, like, it's like, we are here, <laughs> like we are in it. It's like being in a cave that's full of water and kind of having to like take stock of what's around you and what's within you. So Pluto and Scorpio folks are pretty intense. We're a very 
sort of intense generation that loves to explore power, that loves to talk about it. And that can manifest in really incredible ways like revolution and in really challenging ways like authoritarianism. So there's a lot of um, playing with the two and trying to kind of understand how we can use power for positive growth. Oh, I love it. I We're going to get into this a little later in the episode, but I have a strong obsession with like, not just, not millennial specifically, but that millennial micro generation that you were part of, Jana, that like, uh, there is just something about like these, everyone who is 33 right now, like, are you going to make it? Are you going to live out your potential? Are we going to topple these systems, yeah. rebuild something great? Like, we didn't come here to fix a broken world. We came here to build the world of our dreams. And like, are you going to dream? And are you going to do yeah. that you're born to do? And that question is not just for you, Janet, it's for everybody. So, um, I mean, the 33 year old specifically right now, but also everybody too. Yeah. Like, we need everyone's um, help to really create this revolution. Um, okay. So for sure. one of the overt themes of my podcast is just like the millions of ways there are to be a happy, successful adult. And I would love to hear about how you got into tarot astrology and Akashic records and like a little bit about like where you grew up and how you became the Jana that is currently located in so-called Austin, Texas. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So astrology found me when I was on the precipice of my Saturn return. Uh, I was living in San Francisco at the time. I was in a really unhealthy relationship. I was in a job that I hated and I was sort of, I was also going through a physical health crisis at the time and my body was sort of rejecting me. And so it felt like everything in my life was out of alignment and I had no idea how to even begin to kind of unpack that or explore it. And my, I think I was like drinking wine at the kitchen table of our like tiny little apartment in Nopa in San Francisco, which is just north of the panhandle. And my roommate, Rihanna, uh, not the Rihanna, but a Rihanna <laughs> slapped this <laughs> astrology book down on the table and was like, let's look at your chart. And at the time, you know, I was like, oh, I'm a Taurus. And, uh, but I kind of even rejected that because I knew like all the stereotypes of, of Tauri. Um, but Rihanna told me about my Leo moon and my Venus and Pisces. And I was just so struck. It was one of those moments where you feel so seen and like all of these things start kind of like flying into focus in front of you. And I was so incredibly amazed and immediately drawn to it. And so I started just going deep, like as a Plutonian people, a Plutonian person who can be extremely obsessive. I have Mercury and my son opposite Pluto within like a degree or two. Um, so I can like go deep on things when they catch my interest. And so I basically dove in head first and started consuming as much astrology as I could listening to all the podcasts I could find. Um, I had my first like real reading quote unquote with Jeff Hinshaw of cosmic cousins, um, after I'd moved to San Francisco, it was shortly after that, that I basically like like tossed a little bomb into my life and was like, I'm going to leave my job, leave my relationship, get a tarot deck, start doing that, move to Portland, Oregon, and like try to heal my body and my heart. And so the next two or three years of my Saturn return were spent in really deep reflection and discovery. Um, it's then that I encountered the Akashic records through an old friend from San Francisco who was offering free readings at the time. And I was really gifted to be able to receive that from her. And at the end of the reading, she said something like, you really need to start exploring this yourself. And there's a sort of like urgency to it. 
And I didn't know what that meant, but I also simultaneously had received information from Jeff Henshaw where he was like, you could be an astrologer if you wanted to. And so I had these people who were like nudging me, who were receiving these messages and pointing me down that path. And so it did not feel like it was as much of a conscious choice as it was just me accepting the invitation. Um, and so I just kept doing that. And I'd been working in tech for a long time in marketing and freelance writing. Um, and it just was not, you know, it was not it. And I enrolled in a first year astrology program with Portland School of Astrology led by JP Hawthorne and Amanda Moreno, met some incredible astrology humans and then found my community. And that was kind of the like inroad to me understanding who I was and kind of what I'm here to do. So yeah, that's the spark notes. <laughs> I love it. What was your first tarot deck? My first tarot deck was just the very traditional uh, Smith Rider Waite deck, but the first deck that I was gifted, which, you know, people say is like your magical deck, um, was the Toth Tarot by Crowley. So that's the one that kind of got me super invested in tarot and exploring. Oh, I love that. Um, my first tarot deck yeah. was the Collective Tarot. Um, which was a collective art project. It was actually, I mean, if you can get a, a handle on that deck, just at some point, look at it, read the book. The book is incredible. It has the best description of the 10 of cups in most decks. It's bottles in that deck um, about like, like um, it's so, it's such a good deck. And it's so funny because like, also your decks will speak to you. And it was a good intro to me because I was very comfortable with queer community and queer liberation and politics. I wasn't at the time comfortable with spirituality. It was still very new to me and divination practices and things like that. Now I'm like a hungry hippo for it. I love it. But like, you know, you yeah. take baby steps and you have like the comforting queer ancestors to carry you in. And then they're like, this yeah. isn't really like regular tarot. There are other tarots. And so it was so funny because like there was a moment where I knew that deck wasn't talking to me anymore and, and she wanted to be rehomed. And yeah. uh, I got the angel tarot deck. Uh, when it still, I mean, mine still says Doreen Virtue on it, even though it no longer has her byline. So it's a little bit of a relic, which I love. Because um, you can change your mind about what you want to do. And you can just decide, I know I've authored a lot of tarot decks, but I'm not doing that anymore. And that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I got that deck and that was the deck that wanted to work with me. And so I gifted it to my friend. But, um, you know, because you want to keep them moving. Like Fraggles, Fraggles give yeah. that keep moving people so yeah it's always fun yeah. to think about like what's your first deck and like how'd you get it and what was the first gifted gift deck and now I'm gonna have to think about yeah gifted deck um, yeah yeah it's powerful it's yeah. it's a really magical experience and I like that you said that the decks chose you because that is how it feels and I think how it goes like they they kind of steer the relationship in a lot of ways and it is a relationship it's not just a tool Yes, it is a relationship. And we're really, I mean, I learned this from Leah Garza and it's changed my life. Like we're in relationship with everything around us. Like not just the people, yeah. not just the animals, not just the plants, but also like my emotional support stack of books, you know, like my art, like yeah, all of it is a relationship. And so when you can let your cards talk to you and connect with you, that's just opening up more to what, how the guides want to use you as a vessel to, you know, channel or spread God's love or whatever your vibe is. Um, I had another deck that I found, uh, my favorite, uh, metaphysical store in Palm Springs is called Crystal Fantasy. And my grandmother, before she passed away, lived in Rancho Mirage right nearby. And so every time I would visit her, we would go to Crystal Fantasy. And my grandmother was like really into astrology, but like only sort of into the other metaphysical stuff. So I can always tell she was a little mm -hmm. more, she went with me. Um, and she really didn't like the reading she got whenever she got a reading, uh, like from the, the people who were there offering, like pay what you can reading. She hated her reading. I don't know what it said. Was this like a tarot reading or like a psychic reading? It was some kind of like Oracle card, I think reading or psychic reading, yeah. but my grandmother was like a Capricorn who's very self-delusional. So if she heard what she didn't want to hear. Mm. Um, she would get mad about it. That's just yeah. like so yeah. I always love my readings because like I know with information I can make higher vibration choices and um, yeah. 
and I feel very empowered by it, but I think I also really attract and am very good at discerning like who I'm connecting with. Like I wouldn't, if I didn't vibe with someone who was offering pop-up readings, I wouldn't get a reading. And yeah, but there was a deck that spoke to me that day. Cause I knew I wanted an, an Oracle deck and I had just been listening to the Hay House World Summit. Um, they do something similar like this every year where they get a bunch of their authors in to do like hour long, essentially podcasts or lessons. And I learned a lot from it. Um, and I was listening to one and uh, then grandmother and I went to this store and I like there was this deck that was just sitting on a shelf. It wasn't with the other decks. I had already look, looked through the decks and didn't really vibe with anything, but it was just sitting alone on a shelf of used books. And I was like, this deck and I picked it up and I, I just knew it was the deck. I knew it was, it was the one. So I bought it yeah. when I got home and I picked up that, um, the interview that I had been listening to, it was the same author <laughs> of the deck. It was like, Oh my God. It was, <gasps> and wow. they don't print anymore. And it's like, Oh my God. It's called the answer is simple by Sonia Choquette. And it is a cunty deck. Like she is, she will tell you the tea about how <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like spirit yeah. does this, ego does spirit. this stop fucking up yeah yeah man that's so cool oh I love when a deck just appears to you because they do kind of come through as like guides themselves like I think that our guides obviously speak to us through decks but also the the artist also the creator and the deck itself obviously has its own energy and its own life and and it can in many ways just you know, we're going to initiate a, a romance. We're going to break up. It all happens. Yeah. It's so good too. And I want to give anyone out there, if you're newer to this kind of stuff, start just looking at the cards that pull up and like, look at the art and just like get into it and get into mm -hmm. what you're talking to about the art. That was the first thing I ever learned about tarot uh, or Oracle cards, any kind of divination. It's just really sit with your intuition about the art, like what's coming through. Yeah. Like, you know, you read the book for some information and some books are better than others. And some readers get into the books and some readers just get to know the cards and do what they do. Your cards are beautiful. Yeah. And I just want to give a shout out to your burgeoning YouTube page with your pick a pile readings. And oh, all thank you. I feel like I like hang so much in your orbit that there's always a pile that is for me. That is like, this is what <laughs> my life. Thank you, Jana. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah and helpful it's so cool how that happens I mean because it is it's like it's influenced by the people who you've already attracted and have yet to attract and um I've heard that from a couple people that that are you know pretty intimate and yeah we yeah, it's the piles are for you but it's so cool to see it happen it's it never ceases to amaze me when people are like oh my god it was spot on like I don't know it's just spirit talking through but it's, yeah, it's very magical. It's really fun. Oh, I'm so grateful for you as a channeler, as someone who's leaning into her gifts and offering her gifts. Like so many people die with their gifts still inside them. And you're like doing the risky thing. You're putting out the website. You're you're available for clients. You're making pick a piles, like you're doing it. So, and Thank beautiful. You. Again, like Jana's like mise-en-scene, of course, as a Taurus, always has rose petals. <laughs> <laughs> always, always, yeah. Sensuous. it's necessary it is beauty necessary. is necessary yes yeah. that is a Taurus thing to say beauty is necessary so are naps and so are snaps yeah. um and absolutely yeah yeah good friends good conversation okay um you taught me this in my year ahead reading you did a reading that you called shuffle mancy which I keep calling spotify um <laughs> yeah but like basically you made me a playlist that has like the first three songs are like my year ahead songs for general love and career. And then you did quarter by quarter and put three new songs. It was incredible. I'd never gotten yeah. a station playlist before. And your playlists are all great. <laughs> great taste of music. Um, so oh, talk more you. about Shuffle Mancy and Spotify Mancy and how you use that as a practice. Sure. I love Shuffle Mancy. It's so fun. I I love creating playlists. I've been creating playlists for people I love since I was a tween. Um, it's a major love language for me. So I have decided at some point that I needed to fuse that with what I'm offering because it's so pleasurable to me. And 
I started creating playlists for the new moon and full moon at first. And it was just for myself, really. I didn't share them around. But then eventually I would be like, oh, we have a transit coming up and would just kind of like choose a playlist or choose my liked songs and then choose a number and kind of just skip through that many numbers and play the song that came up. And it was always accurate, accurate as in it sort of brought the right information at the right time and the right energy. And so I started doing that for folks that I work with because I think music is a really important medium of understanding that can kind of bypass the critical mind and help us receive information, both like literally lyrically, but also, of course, just the energy of music is, is such a vibrational answer. And so I decided to do that for the year heads, which is something I hadn't really explicitly offered before. So that batch, the, the one that I created for you, and then a few other folks who won that giveaway, um, that was the first time I've really done that. And yeah, it wasn't like, it just kind of hit me. I think it was just what needed to happen for that particular group of people. But since then, because they resonated, I've been doing it more often and I just really enjoy it. It's fascinating because I'll go to my liked songs, which have like such a wide variety of genres. But when I'm channeling for one person, it'll naturally pick up the music and the genres that are like most resonant for that person. Um, which is so wild to witness. Like I did, I think it was three or four different playlists and they were so radically different, but all had like a sort of focused energy to them. Um, so yeah, if you're trying to like get started with shuffle Nancy, I, my suggestion is just to go to your liked songs, turn shuffle on and ask a question or just say, I'd like a song right now and just hit play and see what comes up. Um, it's very fun. It's, and I think we all do it subconsciously too. I think we do. I really think the Spotify robots are my favorite of all the robots that we get to have access to. <laughs> Although I do appreciate many yeah. of the other ones, including my home assistant. I will not say her name. Um, she Her name starts with G. I think she's the best of the home assistants. I'm just going to put that out there. But um, anyway. Okay. Uh, but like, I am such a music nerd. Same with making playlists. Like I RIP the days of like recording to a cassette tape from a CD uh, all my favorite songs for somebody I really yeah. like and then like timing the flip over song like what's the song that doesn't have to finish up like or do we just like put a little like whatever zhuzh at the end and then flip it over and then what's the mm -hmm. cover I'm gonna make for the cover of the cassette tape like this is the love language I want to give the people I love and so yes. I have playlists I have almost a thousand Spotify playlists now um which is I think wow more than average That's but like you know so I teach work I teach aerobics and I make a new playlist for every class so um you know I can sometimes have three yeah. weeks for aerobics so that accelerates it but I mean I have playlists for big feelings I've in like and I'll just put it on shuffle and mm -hmm. just ask the goddess like what song do I need to hear to like get my feelings out because it might be a cry yeah. thing, but it might be a tantrum song you know like depends on yes. like, what I need right like if you are tired of the pandemic I suggest corduroy by Pearl Jam uh the waiting drove me mad you're finally here and I'm a mess uh scream it in the forest jump around it will really move your energy <laughs> yeah it does it's it's so powerful yeah and, and for people who are musically inclined or just you know people who may not want to work with the tarot deck or may not, not want to work with like more traditional forms of divination. I think it's a really easy access point into magic. And it's something that like most of us have been doing for a very long time since we were little tweens anyway. So. Yes, exactly. When I was crying on the floor, listening to Mariah Carey's uh, debut CD. Thank you, Mariah Angela Carey for your art. Um, I needed it, you know. I, I just want to say, I think it's so hysterical and singular for you to use all of these celebrities' middle names. And the fact that you know them, you have this like memory bank of middle names within you. I crack up every time. Like it never fails to amuse me when I hear you reference. What's Taylor Swift's middle name? Taylor Allison Swift with two L's. Okay. 
Okay. No, it might be one there else. But every time, yeah. every time I second guess myself and I always Google just to make sure I'm correct when I publish it, but um, Taylor Allison. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, if I really like or love someone, I want to know their whole name and then I'm probably going to address them as their whole name, just like in just regular conversation, you know, every now and again, you want to like, just throw down someone's full name. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Almost, it's like a nickname or a title and like Dolly Rebecca Parton. I mean, why wouldn't we know her whole name? Like she's so magnificent. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, and it's so cool because our names contain so much energy and when you call someone by their full name it is kind of like I'm bringing all parts of you into this conversation with us yes absolutely Prince Rogers Nelson I mean I I sincerely if I ever get the chance to parent twins I kind of want their middle names to be Rogers and Nelson because like you know I mean yeah the yeah. greatest Gemini that ever lived I'll say it I know all my Gemini friends want to be the greatest but it was Prince <laughs> And I, I think a lot of people would be on your page with that one. Yeah. Listen, I'd say it's not a deal breaker. You don't have to think he's the greatest Gemini, but um, you have to know and appreciate that. I think he's the greatest Gemini. Um, yeah. yeah. Note it, write it down, keep it somewhere safe. <laughs> Come back to it often. <laughs> on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, every Gemini that is butter. Yeah now it's okay it's your just your way to feel better by now um okay let's talk about this millennial micro generation and like how they're here to save the world um so there's this theory it's not my theory no big deal no <laughs> big deal but also big deal I think this is the year I like to call the universe central casting sometimes um and mm -hmm. it's just like you know because they're behind the scenes trying it's a divine strategy but it's an infinite mystery so like who knows like they know what's trying to unfold but it's a mystery about how it's going to unfold because spirit sees thousands of possibilities while our ego um sees only limited yeah. possibilities and our trauma brain sees black and white like maybe one or two possibilities so remember when you're not mm -hmm. seeing possibilities you might be activated so calm your nervous system my favorite way to calm my nervous system is just three deep breaths, very deep breaths with an audible exhale um, and maybe a little shake out, a little stim. Um, I do that every time I go to the bathroom. I learned it from you. You said it in one of my readings. You were like, you need to microdose <laughs> big feelings. And I was like, okay, how can I microdose my big feelings? And I was like, okay, when I go to the bathroom, I had already started stimming, yeah. just, just shaking, just releasing energy. But like microdosing my my big emotions as a Scorpio moon, anybody with a lot of water in their mm -hmm. heart has a lot mm -hmm. of feelings. You're just a conduit for feelings. And so anyway, when you're seeing limited yes. options, remember that you're in trauma brain and you probably need to yes. take rest and allow. And sometimes you need to like reach out to trusted people to help you understand that you there's always possibilities. Uncertainty is mm -hmm. fact of life. And part of coloniality is trying to subdue us into this like um, hypnotism of safety. Like, oh, everything's okay. The police are here to protect us. When in fact, mm -hmm. you're to protect private property and like uh, quell political uprising. Like they're not actually here to help you. Um, so all that. Yes. <laughs> Central <laughs> deny your intuition. Your fear isn't here. It's yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It's important. Because so much spirituality can be so bypassy and ignore the very visceral realities that we're experiencing every day and tell us that our, you know, we should just meditate away our fear and, you know, go do hot yoga or something. And <laughs> it's a no. Yeah. Which like, yes, all of those things help. Like meditation helps, yoga helps. They help you flow the feelings, but like the feelings are there to give you information. And sometimes the information is inconvenient before the podcast, we were talking about some inconvenient information, my psychic. I mean, sometimes you're not as psychic as you think you should be or could be because you're not willing to be present for the um, inconvenient information. And that I yes. a lot of time denying my intuition and living in this total, like, sub reality uh because like I could I didn't feel safe enough to be present for the things that were inconvenient um 100 percent and I think like the fact that when we make the hard but necessary choices in life to leave situations that are not right for us to uproot ourselves that's often when we have psychic awakenings because 
we've acknowledged something that's true. And it's like each time we sort of follow that, we deepen our ability to connect, but it's fucking hard sometimes. I'm sorry, am I allowed to say fuck on this podcast? Oh, we have no rules. Like there's just, okay. there's no Great. purity. <laughs> purity is a, a white supremacist culture thing. So we don't have yes. purity here. Um, Great. We're just here to be free. We're, we're Lilith thing here. We're Lilith thing. Um, when you say Lilith thing, what do you mean? I'm kind of obsessed with Lilith. I mean, rejecting patriarchal norms. I mean, rejecting oppression and chasing your own pleasure, chasing your own energy and allowing it to just express itself fully. Mm -hmm. um, Lilith was like reclaimed by the feminist movement as a sort of like heroic myth mythological figure. Um, but for a long ass time was like super vilified as a like demon shadow queen who ate babies and yeah wow. just good stuff just it's, light material you know I can yeah. I can relate to having people spread uh negative stories about me <laughs> to try to diffuse the influence yep. I have on people to pursue their their authenticity and their their true power so yep um and I do yep. not especially with Jupiter conjunct Lilith that energy is so big for you and can show up really radically in community and in really incredible ways that can be super exciting and like inspiring for people who are tapped into their own Lilith energy but can be deeply confronting and scary and unnerving and triggering for people who are not and that for you that showing up in your house of community and like your life vision and dreams means that like you really get to express that in a big way with all that jupiterian good good behind it yeah but it's hard it is hard all of it is i mean you know it's hard and some you know you get some aspects that are hard and some aspects that are easy like i think like my chart ruler is my Saturn in Virgo in the 12th house, um, just hovering mm. right above my ascendant and like right above my North node in the first house. And so like, I feel like, you know, hard astrology, <laughs> like, but mm -hmm. also, you know, a beautiful life with a lot of beautiful people in my life and a lot of choice around cheerfulness and hope, like Scorpio moon can go real dark, mm -hmm. real easy. Um, and I spent a lot, I wasted a lot of my life being very depressed as a teenager because of, you know, just not having the tools to live happier and yeah, a lot of me living happier in this incarnation is in defiance to white supremacist patriarchal capitalism. And I'm not going to stop talking about that. And I'm not going to stop sharing with people how I pursue my joy. Yes. It is hard fought. Yes, 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 yes. The pursuit of joy is not like some easy breezy experience. It's like it's radical and it's messy. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think we talk about that a whole lot when we're getting raised in like nuclear, like, you know, straight, like homogenous spaces where it's like, you just choose the major you want to do in college and like choose the job and got the, the husband. <laughs> it's like uh no joy requires us to be radical and if we're not like pushing up against the systems that are oppressing us then we're not really experiencing true joy it's like more complacency and that's hard to accept it is hard to accept and also here's something i learned in 2023 is falling in love is hard like objectively it is yeah. difficult to release control over your feelings right like it's we're raised to believe that falling in love is the answer and it's like this prince charming energy when in fact we know that we are not only just cinderella we're the fairy godmother and we're prince charming it's us that's showing yeah, up. and like exactly. our, our friends are the friendly mice and the birds and the people on our side <laughs> and like the people who we have soul contracts in to give us trauma are the stepmom and the stepsisters right like but like we are the prince charming and like we have to show up for ourselves and that's the pursuit of joy. And like love is joyful and full of grief. And I will say this as your Scorpio moon. Yes. To you, Janet. Yes. Everyone out there, 
that everyone you love will betray you or die and sometimes both and it will still be worth the ride that is the most scorpio moon thing that is ever scorpio moon and yeah like that's you know that's that's so powerful and true and like I've been grappling with that recently because of my own trust stuff and like asking the question, like, how can I trust and and who can I trust? And it's like, it's so much less so about the other person. I mean, there are some people you should not fucking trust, but, but it's, it's so much more about us and our level of trust in ourselves and our boundaries and the way that we keep ourselves safe and like protect, but also open up in relationships and I feel like Scorpio moons are really incredible teachers when it comes to all matters of trust and intimacy and yeah, it's like deep, deep work that is scary and hard. Intuition is self-trust and so is healing from intimate partner violence. Like all of these things require your intense self-trust, like trusting your discernment, trusting your work, trusting the people who support you. I'm never not going to be in therapy, you know, like, or, and, or in recovery process, because I know the way I was raised did not give me the capacity to hold what I need to hold in order to be the person and the best Bevan I can be in this lifetime and to love my people. Three things I need to be great at being Bevan, teaching fat kid dance party aerobics and loving my people. And that's what self-trust helps me do best. Um, Yes. Any more thoughts on self-trust or intuition before we move into Taylor, Allison, Swiss birth chart? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, so many thoughts. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm a person who believes that everyone is psychic and that everyone has the capacity to tune into their psychic abilities. And it's less so a process of discovery as it is just peeling back layers of conditioning. And psychic abilities, intuition, like they can be kind of synonymous, but, um, I would just say like for anyone who, who doesn't identify as being intuitive or for anyone who is struggling a lot with self-trust, um, you have to go slow and you have to give yourself opportunities to be correct And that often means making scary choices, like putting yourself into situations where you're going to have to listen to your intuition, not like dangerous situations, but like if you're dating and you're exploring people's energy, you have to put yourself out there in order to understand how your intuition is like right on the money. And it's all about experience. And I think like if we're living kind of really contained within ourselves and not like experiencing life in some ways, it's hard to trust ourselves because we just don't have enough data points to even do it. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's kind of a tangent, but yeah. It's just, I mean, we're all in a sort of training process. It might be the most important thing you said on this podcast, actually. Um, just empowering people to understand. Yeah, you too. You know, like you and I are swimming in the psychic waters of south node pisces venus and pisces pisces is the most psychic sign it's the 12th house sign it's everything it's this world and the other world it's the dreams it's the big dreams and like virgo is the container yeah and yes so, pisces i'm yes. a big, you're also a north node nerd too and i'm a big believer like that mm-hmm. life path in your chart between your south node and your north node will you talk on that just to give the people an understanding of what that means yeah Sure. Yeah. So um, the North Node and the South Node are the lunar nodes. They're not actual celestial bodies, but they're like these hypothetical points in the sky. And they speak a lot to our soul's journey and the path of evolution and growth and understanding. Um, A lot of people focus on the North Node because that you know, we're a sort of like growth and future oriented society, but the South node contains so much power and wisdom because it's material that we are here to integrate and here to learn about and often kind of speaks to the energies that we may have been swimming in, in past incarnations. 
Uh, again, if you believe in that, and even if you don't, it can just indicate kind of past experiences, like even childhood and early conditioning. Um, so the South Node kind of speaks to what we're here to, to integrate and sort of bring into balance. And the North Node speaks more to what we're here to learn about. And neither is good or bad. They just are. And leaning too far into one can create tricky circumstances. So it's an axis. And because of that, the axis cannot exist without one side or the other. And so like in Vedic, um, there's like Rahu and Ketu, which is like the head of the dragon and the tail or the head of the serpent and the tail. And the North node is the head. It's sort of like this idea that it's all consuming. And if so, if you lean into your North node path of like evolution, you can get kind of swept away by hunger and ambition. And then if you lean too much into the tail, you get sort of like swept into the past and stuck in the past. Um, so it tells us a lot about ourselves and, and can help us really in understanding a lot of the repetitive sort of karmic patterns that we get locked into. Does that, does that make sense? It, it gets a little sense. like wispy when talking about these things because they're so esoteric. I think if I were to be like tighter on the explanation, I would just say it's your life path and North Node is like what you're trying to learn in this lifetime and South Node is your mastery from a previous mm -hmm. life. So if I come in with a Pisces South Node, yeah, I'm exactly in, in dreaming and being a big dreamer and like also mm -hmm. psychic, just naturally psychic. And, um, and then with the Scorpio moon, I feel like that just like makes me very people psychic, like, um, and then the North mm -hmm. Node Virgo means like, it's a struggle area for me. Right. And like, I, I'm frequently jealous when I look at a chart and someone's North Node is like in their sun sign or some, or Mars, even like where mm -hmm. they have that yeah. thrive and that natural capacity in their North Node. It like, it's just, it's just an easier placement, which is fine because everyone has their hard and they're easy. And some people are here for an easy lifetime and that's okay too. Fairness doesn't matter to central casting. They're here to see you learn your lessons. That's the whole point. So yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So central casting wants to know, I think by the time you're 33 years old, I really believe 33 is like people call it the Jesus year, but it's basically the year after you've integrated the lessons from all your Saturn return stuff, which is typically between 27 and 30. But like my Saturn return was like a six year journey because I had a big Pluto transit during that time, a wrecking ball yeah. off in my life. I was, everything had to be cleared out. I like um, the theory that Saturn is crone energy. So Saturn is you as mm -hmm. a wise woman at the end of your life, having learned all the lessons, comes back to whenever Saturn's returning through your chart to tell you how you're fucking up. And basically like I lost my fiance, I lost my job of five years and I lost my apartment all within like a period of time during Saturn return. It was really devastating. Yeah. I really had this idea of what my life should look like and it was unraveling. And I also had major health issues that I was dealing with. Um, and then when I was 33, I finally decided to give up alcohol and um, sugar, essentially, like, and coffee. So, like, those three things were really, like, mm -hmm. with my digestion. And I just was, like, I don't think I'm willing to suffer <laughs> through because of my behavior anymore. And, like, I think that level of maturity yeah. holds central casting. Okay, Bevan's in. She's going to go for her potential. She's going to pursue her true path. And I'll say this, like 11 years later at 44, like I'm on that path. And I don't even know that at 33, I would have consciously said, yeah, I'm here to live up to my potential. I think I was too intimidated about the uncertainty around yeah. that. But now I'm like, I mean, I just feel like uncertainty is Tuesday. You know what I mean? When the pandemic hit, I was like, oh, I've been living with, through a year of epic uncertainty. This is no worse, you yeah. know? And like, Anyway, so I, I think 33 is such a crucial year for this decision because I think central casting is like setting things up for you to be on that path if you're willing to make that decision to just live into your potential. And it just means like getting a little out of your comfort zone every day, just a little bit. Um, so yeah. I wanted to talk about Taylor Swift's chart specifically because as like the, I think the most public person who was born in 1989, uh, we have access to this, right? Um, oh, look, perfect. It, it's a cat ad on the side of her chart. So I think that's beautiful. For Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, but I also love because you're part of this generation. So this like these outer planets are your outer planets. Like 
Um, and so I love yeah. your perspective on this. And I also want to give a shout out to Colin Bedell, who's been on my podcast before of Queer Cosmos, whose theory this is about the millennial Capricorn stack um, that I learned through my friend McKay, who's also been on this podcast, who is also part of your millennial micro generation. So is Colin. So like you're all my 1989 heroes, uh, my Pluto and Scorpio babes um, uh, and Aquarius North Node babes too. So let's talk about yeah. uh, all of these outer planets. And like what her chart says to you. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, for context, I know very little about Taylor Swift. So this is part of the fun of this conversation is that I'm not a fan. So <laughs> this is going to be a little more um, maybe objective, maybe biased. I don't know. But um, what you're referring to with the cap stack is the Saturn Uranus Neptune mashup in Capricorn. That's a feature of folks who were born in, I think it's 1989 to 1991-ish. Um, is that wrong? That could be wrong. No, I think that's right. Cause I think Saturn moved into Aquarius in 1991. Um, and so this is a pretty heavy placement because these are three outer planets. They're generational signatures that have really huge impacts on society. Uh, and so when we're looking at the outer planets, we're thinking about what's occurring externally and then the way that that echoes within us personally. So the collective and the personal level. Um, and with Capricorn, we're thinking about structure and authority, and we're thinking about the authority that exists around us and also within us. So there are a lot of conversations, I think, among this little micro generation about internalized capitalism and about the ways that we punish ourselves, the ways that we uh, become the sort of like cop to ourselves and where that voice comes from and how discovering the ways that we take these like the horrifying elements of capitalism of which there are many and sort of like personalize those and become the inner critic who polices us become the oppressive parent who tramples on our dreams um, and I think that like with this generation in particular there's been a lot of movement toward deprogramming and sort of decolonizing um, and on the other hand, there's a lot of people in our generation who very diligently uphold capitalism and um, you get kind of these like polar opposite experiences. Um, talk about the carceral system yeah. in the brain and like how you become yeah. programmed with the critical voice of whoever raised you from zero to seven. Like that just becomes the, yes. the thought loops you have. And one of the most important things you'll do in body liberation, in mind liberation, is to evict the cop from your brain. So if you're born with this signature of like really absorbing the carceral system, I want you to really get curious about the limiting beliefs that are coming through you and ask whose limiting belief is this? Is this mine? Is this what I choose for me? Or is this coming from somewhere else? And the more yeah. you condition yourself to question your thoughts, you can't control your first thought, but you can control the second, third and subsequent thoughts. And I like a mantra yes. for like, you know, when you don't have the time to stop and like examine your thoughts, I like a mantra, like all bodies are good bodies or like, you know, I love myself. I love everyone around me. Right. Like just choosing what ethic you want to live. Right. But when you have the time, mm -hmm. I hope you make the time to pause and consider what is this thought that keeps coming through and where did it come from? You will begin to evict mm -hmm. the cop that lives in your brain. And that's a really important part about uh, like decoloniality is just like dissolving the carceral system. I want to see it dissolved in my lifetime. That is my goal. Um, like the physical carceral system, but also the mental, emotional, and spiritual one that is programmed into us yes. through yes. coloniality. Totally. Yes. I love the idea of evicting <laughs> the cop within. Uh, then we reclaim our inner landlord, I guess, or also evict them, but um, fuck landlords. Anyway, um, I, 
Yeah. Plus one to all of that, because also what you're describing is so much like the work of internal family systems and, and any form of parts work where we identify that like the voice within us is not self. It's not true necessarily. And that sort of perspective and detachment gives us the capacity to come back to our own energy and to sort of heal the wounded parts of us below that are really believing these false narratives that they're being told. And that's such powerful work. And like people talk about astrology sometimes as like narcissistic or this sort of like navel gazing energy. Um, but like astrology and meaning making systems can enable us to heal at a personal level, what also needs to be healed at the collective level. And then that empowers us to see the collective differently and to be agents of change. And I think like that is really big work that is not limited to this generation, but that this generation is sort of, I think, coming into more. Yes. I think this generation has a signature that enables it to make incredible change, but everyone, literally everyone, if you're listening to this podcast and you're 87 years old, you becoming more you helps to level up the timelines on the earth. It's so true. Even you just taking the time to meditate. If you meditate once, you will level up the earth. Like- meditating every day. OMG, meditating three times a day. Wow. You know what I mean? Like you can really change the world yes. by just slowing down and being present for self and thinking about your thoughts and like getting critical about what's going through your head. It makes it, it and, and like one in 200 people doing that would mean we could all live in utopia, laying on the forest floor, eating fruit and never having to work again, literally. <laughs> yeah. it's, oh, it's a Taurus dream. <laughs> Yes. It is yes, 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 right. yes. You were incarnated here and that could have been how it was. And instead we had, they created <laughs> bills and jobs and student loans so that two companies could get very wealthy and run the entire world. And it is like nation yeah. states don't really exist. They are just an idea. And like I yes. say, so-called Austin, Texas, I say so-called Olympic Peninsula. Yes. Because it's made up by who? By a man who came with a gun and like stole it from yes. people who were peacefully living here playing music and eating fruit you know like anyway <laughs> yeah let's talk about Chiron a fucking man and, and a gun Chiron and Jupiter uh in <laughs> cancer as part of this energetic signal yeah. yeah 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 so you can't see it on this chart um but there is an asteroid Chiron um also known as like a centaur that is probably right by Taylor Swift's Jupiter. Um, oh my God, centaur. It's got to be close. Wow, okay. Yeah. I it, I'm just, yeah. I, I had a centaur come through in my Akashic Records yesterday and now I'm just making all these. Ah, with cool. That. Yeah. You know who that centaur um, is. Okay, so she has her Chiron um, 15 degrees uh, cancer and then she has her Jupiter seven degrees cancer and her moon one degree cancer. Okay. Yeah. So that's a pretty wide orb. Um, I, if I were reading for Taylor, I probably wouldn't pay a ton of mind to the Chiron Jupiter connection here. Um, but regardless, it figures prominently because when we're thinking about Chiron independently, it's representing a wound within ourselves that some people say is unhealable. For for a lot of people, there's this notion, and I would refer out to uh, my dear friend, astrologer, Iris um, Rivera, who was a guest on my podcast who specializes in Chiron. Um, but, But they told me recently that And sort of this Western idea that we're meant to like completely heal ourselves. It's this Western idea that we can heal all the wounds and that all wounds are meant to be healed. Um, But there's this understanding that wounds give us wisdom, that they give us medicine, and that by exploring the wound, we can discover medicine that we can then deliver to others too. And so with Chiron and cancer, there's a wound around care and a wound around receiving care and love often in the original home um, and often from the original caretakers. So a lot of us Chiron and cancer folks struggle with codependency, struggle with 
um, over nurturing and over tending to others. And that gets amplified with the Jupiter in cancer because Jupiter in cancer loves to care for other and loves to be a container of safety and to be a container of nurturance, which is beautiful energy, but can be really difficult for, for someone holding that container if they're not also receiving it. Um, and then we see, like, as you know, those planets are opposing this Capricorn stack. And so it creates this tension that kind of brings us back to, to your analogy of like the cop, um, that we need to evict because there's this polarity between this concept of care, community care, self-care, and then the punitive systems that remove us from our bodies and from our souls and from our compassion, and so this generation is also experiencing the tug of war between those polarities. And how do we reconcile that? How do we radically demolish the systems that are oppressing us? And how do we care for ourselves and create the therapeutic containers that are necessary to promote healing while also focusing on abolition work? Um, so that's how I read that signature and I didn't know that Taylor had a cancer moon that's sitting right there too but that's powerful she's a powerful um conduit of emotions and expressor of emotions and whenever I think about singers specifically I want to look at their Mars and I want to think about how their Mars mm -hmm. interacts with their audience so like Billie Eilish has Mars in Pisces and you can see that Billie Eilish has a very energetic um otherworldly a psychic connection to her fans. Um, Dolly Rebecca yeah. Parton has Mars and Cancer. Uh, so does John Clayton Mayer. That's like just that signature of just like the deep feelings. And like, I love the cardinal water sign of Cancer and like that nurturing and mm -hmm. like, like, here's my songs and let me help you heal in that heart of yours. Um, and like Taylor's Mars and Scorpio, the way she interacts with her fans, the way she's like, I'm going to be deep and intimate and vulnerable, but to a certain level. And then there's this privacy shield because Scorpio just needs and mm -hmm. wants privacy. Someone once told me about mm -hmm. my chart, like you're very public for a person with so much Scorpio in your chart because I have a stallion in Scorpio. And I'm like, yeah. I think that was me that said that. Maybe it was someone else. <laughs> it was someone else a long time ago, long before I understood all this. But yes, like I'm a surprising person for all the Scorpio for how public I am. Yeah. But I a third house Mercury Sagittarius. I cannot shut up. It's like I have yeah. to, I have to speak the pain that I've experienced so that I can help heal people. Like it's just yeah. A, um yeah, I do, I do struggle with that vulnerability. So it's just interesting because I think Taylor has really learned a lot of lessons and come into her power. Um, in terms of how she closes herself off with some privacy. Mm -hmm. to her fans. It's like, I'll tell you the deep parts mm -hmm. of my soul, but I'm not going to really give you the details. And in many ways, I'm going to say, I opine that the de details are juicy because Mars and Scorpio means like you fuck like a tornado. Um, and I think Aquarius <laughs> zero degrees Venus is like, she's an expert at falling in love and she needs to fall in love in a lot of ways with a lot of people and things in order to just yeah the radiance and she's going to change her aesthetic yeah. over time that's just the eras tour is the perfect thing for an aquarius venus i think because she's going to change her look and that's part of that exploration because aquarius is the consummate explorer an air sign um it's mutable right it's the mutable air sign um it's fixed but it's fixed. but it is the explorer <laughs> for sure oh gemini yeah. gemini is the mutable okay well, yeah yeah but she has um I guess she doesn't have any placements in Gemini, but she, she has this Mercury ruled mid heaven. Um, Mercury is the ruler of Virgo and Virgo is her mid heaven. And um, this is the mid -heaven Mercury is sitting right there in that cap stack. Yeah. 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 So it's fused into that. Yes. Mercury cap stack. Um, okay. Can we talk also about this, like the signature of the North Node Aquarius for our millennial um, micro generation mm -hmm. heroes? Sure. So, um, yeah. So looking at the North Node again, kind of what we're learning about in this lifetime for North Node and Aquarius, which is a fixed air sign that represents um, collective consciousness and collective change. 
uh, Uranus and Saturn are kind of co-rulers of Aquarius. So it's representing like both the way that we rebel against structure and also the way that we create it. And, and that's really kind of an inherent wisdom of Aquarius is creating systems of change. And so that's a very revolutionary placement. The North Node in Aquarius means that this generation is learning how to revolutionize, learning how to create change. Um, and with the polarity, the South Node, which is in Leo, in her case, it's in the ninth house. Um, that polarity, the South Node in Leo is sort of like having spent a lot of time learning about self, learning about expression, learning about play. Um, there's a very, like the sun is the ruler of Leo and the sun is big self energy. It's, it's how we light up and how we express our core energy. And so having this like solar South Node means that there is a lot of focus on self. And a lot of people in this generation struggle with patterns of going like really deep into self energy and then really deep into collective energy. And there's a balance that needs to be struck there between um, not becoming, you know, falling into patterns of self absorption to like an unhealthy degree where you lose sight of the sort of like objectivity and the collective around you. Um, so those are kind of the themes that we play with a lot. And then for her specifically looking at the South node in the ninth house and the North node in the third, um, the ninth being like a house of higher learning, of travel, of expansion. Um, it's typically like the Sag house. Um, so there's a lot of like her having maybe spent a lot of time kind of culturally expanding herself and traveling and maybe getting swept away by ideology and do, does she have a religious background uh not that I know of but I would assume it's just some basic cookie cutter Christian stuff yeah Christian hegemony the perhaps? Can, <laughs> yeah yeah like it's it can just be like structure and um dogma and so moving into the, the third house would be more focused on, on like, how do I communicate about my experiences in a way that it connects people and in a way that revolutionizes the way that people see themselves. Um, and her North node rulers are both sitting in the second house, which is like the house of what you have, what you possess, your values, your, your money, your material possessions, et cetera. So Yeah. It tells me that she's learning about how to express herself and she's making a lot of money off of that. <laughs> Good for her. I hope she's redistributing it. <laughs> I. What do you see when you look at, at these aspects, like you knowing Taylor Swift? Uh, well, I think here's what I love is like, she's growing up in front of us and she's not afraid to change and evolve. And um, I want to reference her 2019 documentary Miss Americana which is on Netflix it um in many ways like I felt personally resentful of her I'll just be honest about my feelings and experience as her fan um, I felt personally resentful of her not leveraging her influence in 2016 to not get Donald Trump elected I think frequently about what would have happened if Bernie Sanders had won in 2016 and how much better it could be for just regular folks right now if that had been the case right yeah. like I'm not saying Taylor, don't yeah, burn time. but I am saying Taylor, you know, it's right. And she knew it was right. Like, that's the thing. It's like, again, like as someone who is psychic, like, I know, you know, it's right to come out and talk about this. So watching her documentary and watching her process around finding her political voice, like, I mean, it's the smallest little thing, but as someone who has been like overtly queer, fat and femme on the internet like by those names since 2002 and like very much leverage my marginalized identities to help other marginalized people find their power like I get resentful of people who get very popular and make a lot of money because they are uh, palatable in a mainstream way and and get yeah. to those beauty standards for their wealth um, and so in that from that spirit of like having always been overtly political and like stood for what I believe is right. And she doesn't have to believe the same things I believe. It's just the fact that she doesn't even do it was frustrating. But then watching the documentary, I kind of understood, first of all, 
she was like bullied on a massive scale. Like not, I don't think any person listening to this podcast, unless it's Taylor Swift has had an entire stadium of people chanting that they hate you, but that energy is incredibly, yeah. uh, spiritually, uh, annihilating like it is so difficult to go through stuff like that and so I have so much compassion for that and I understand yeah. it better now because I, I don't follow Kanye West I didn't know that he was making people chant that that's so fucked up um I mean it's one of the many tiny things he's done that's fucked up and that's, <laughs> that's not a tiny thing um but yeah. so I will say like I have compassion for her having watched that documentary but I loved watching her process of finding her voice and speaking up for what's right and I mean just treating people like with basic human decency uh is real like you need to calm down I love that song I love that she's getting more political I'm excited to see how she continues leveraging her voice and learning her voice and speaking truth to pseudo power and she's I think she's always going to be an independent thinker and I think she's really learning how to come out of that dogma and come into like what she knows is is right. And and I trust her and I trust her discernment and I trust her process of unfolding to figure out what is right for her. Um, and I would love to talk while I have you, my astrology nerd friend, uh, to just nerd out about this Mars <laughs> placement, like one degree from the ascendant. I believe it's first house, um, looking at the degrees of it, because mm -hmm. um, her- yeah. Ascendant is 25 degrees Scorpio, which also means you need a lot of privacy. Scorp strong Scorpio placements, you need like 18 hours of alone time for six hours with people. Um, maybe even more than that. Um, yeah. Okay. The what Pluto we in Scorpio in the 12th house echoes that too. Um, and I think like the experience that you mentioned of the notorious experience of her being chanted at is actually like kind of speaks to that in my mind because Pluto in the 12th often it indicates that there's some type of blowing apart of self that happens where like your ego identity gets literally blown apart in often a really painful way um and I I wonder what was happening what kind of transits she was experiencing uh at that moment in time and if her Pluto was activated at all but you the can Mars, come back on the podcast. The we'll, on do, we'll do transits for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the the Mars conjunct the ascendant. Um, the ascendant's at twenty five degrees Scorpio, and Mars is at twenty six degrees Scorpio. So it's a really tight orb, and Mars and Scorpio has this intensity. It like will like Mars can represent what, what we're willing to fight for and what we desire and what we want to pursue. And the ascendant is like kind of the way that we show up and the way that we're perceived and the sort of like self energy that we put forward. So there's this natural connection and fluidity between those things for her, the, what she believes in, what she wants to stand for can take center stage. Um, but I think it can also be egoic, um, because Mars is the ego. And so probably for her, part of her work is sort of like untangling herself from this like very public ego identity and kind of like, I guess, unhooking from maybe the projections that that, that involves being such a public figure that people have really strong feelings about, like very polarizing. People are like obsessed with Taylor Swift or like really hate her. And I think that that is kind of echoed by that Scorpio ascendant, which can create very like polarizing emotions in other people, uh, love them or hate them kind of energy. Um, yeah. And, and the Pluto stuff for sure. So it's big, it's big energy. There's a lot there. Big, big energy destined for greatness I feel um and also Sagittarius son she brings the party like it's it's a pop star sign like so many pop stars Britney Jean Spears um Ariana Grande yeah. like uh, Billie Eilish all Sagittarius like here to bring the party yeah and she has it in the first house too son in the first her life is about her that's son in first energy she's here to express her energy and um yeah for better or worse <laughs> 
I mean, hopefully for better. <gasps> That's my vibe. <laughs> yeah. We're all, we're I, all I'm, 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 I'm lukewarm. I'm, I'm not a hater. I'm lukewarm. You're luke- it's okay. Great. Um, okay. Well, can we talk about Lilith and Scorpio, um, as a generational imprint? Cause I think that would affect also this micro generation, this Lilith and Scorpio. Hers is. Yeah. Um, so hers is at four degrees, 419 of Scorpio, uh, which would place it actually like right on the 11th, 12th house cusp. Um, so right, like a little, if you cursor where it says 12 would be, yeah, right around there. Oh yeah, you're right. Um, so that's like, I think it looks like the house cusp is at five. So it's like right at the final degree of the 11th house um which 11th house being more about like community and vision and dreams and then the 12th house being sort of like the unconscious and often the parts of ourselves that are the most difficult to access um and so there's this like I think radical process that can exist for her in exploring what it means to go from visibility to darkness from visibility to secrecy or privacy and um I mean that's echoed by a lot of other stuff in the chart but being in Scorpio it does feel like there's her probably having to grapple with her relationship to the larger collective all the time what that means what it means to be in relationship with millions of people who are obsessed with her or hate her all at once and the amount of like energy that comes at you when people have feelings like that, very 12th house Pluto, very susceptible to feeling all of that and probably needs to go deep into hiding to like energetically release a lot of the stuff that comes up and that gets attached to her. I sincerely hope that she has a strong spiritual hygiene practice. And if she doesn't, that she has hired yeah. perhaps a Reiki master uh, who lives in the woods to protect her. Mm-hmm. Like she, like she really needs that protection, that energy. I mean, I need it and I don't have millions of people in relationship with me. Yeah. But I definitely feel that like some people think I'm a Disney princess and some people think I'm an evil queen. And like, I can't do anything about either. Yeah. I'm just living and singing with the birds in the forest. So And do you think there's anything specific to my inherent compatibility with her? Because we both have 11th house Lilith. (laughs) Um, I'm sure there's a shared understanding, you know, and they're also both fixed Liliths. You have Lilith and Leo, Mm -hmm. which squares Lilith and Scorpio. So the fixed signs kind of more so than the other, um, the other like mutable and um, cardinal kind of have an inherent understanding of each other. And there's a reason for that. And I can't remember it. Uh, It's really technical, but yeah, for sure. Like shared understanding, I think. And then we would have to look at your composite chart and, and next time we'll do some transit and then we'll look at my composite chart with Taylor Allison Swift. uh, If we are in fact, MFEO as I believe we are. Um, yeah, Jana, anything you want to say about the millennial Capricorn stack generation astrology before we close out this chart? Um, what do, what would I say? I don't know. I mean, I guess if you're a part of this generation, like use your power and, and learn about it. Um, and truly understanding your personal power is huge medicine for Pluto and Scorpio and, um, for anyone as a human, but particularly for this generation and then particularly for the cap stack who do have, I think, a potential to make a lot of really systemic changes. So learn about your power. I'm excited for this and I'm excited for them to dissolve the carceral system in their mind. Um, and Jana, for anybody who wants mm-hmm. to have your chart expertise applied to their <laughs> birth chart or a tarot reading or an Akashic Records reading, or just to follow you on the internet, where can they find you? And all of these links will be in the show notes. Yeah. So you can find me at feeling loudly on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, I, you can find me at feelingloudly.com. 
and I have my services, which you can book there. And yeah, I think that's it. I mean, you can find me in real life if we ever stumble into each other, but it's rare. I'm a 12th house person. You're like in hiding kind of sometimes. Yeah. I mean, full same. Actually. Yeah. Um, but I do love when people come and say hi to me at the grocery store. Sometimes that happens. It's always a surprise, but a delight. Um, yeah. like a, like a fan, like a fan yes. who rolls up and says hi. That's cool. Really? You get like, seen. I, I, I call it being grocery store famous. And I did not think it was going to happen when I moved up to the woods, but it has happened many times. Yeah. Someone who was like, do you do an aerobics class? And I was like, yes. And she said, I recognized your bow from the internet I didn't know you lived here and I was like here I am like in this tiny Aww, and that was- that's so cool it is cool yeah. I mean it's one of those things where like I'm not out here for fame I'm really out here for influence and just to make the world better because I went through some pain and I want you to know how I navigated it and like I teach aerobics yeah. you learn 20 times faster you learn something in under 20 repetitions if you learn it with play versus 400 repetitions in mm. other ways and I took 20 something years to learn how to love my body and love myself as the weirdo I am. And I want to give you the shortcuts. So that's why I teach aerobics. Plus I knew I needed to work yeah. out the rest of my life. And I'm a Capricorn, Mars and sun. And so I'm practical. Third, third, fourth. Yeah. House. Something about the yeah. body, you know, fourth house. Anyway. Um, ah. I love you, Jana. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for sharing your expertise. I love you too. We could really nerd out about Taylor Swift for hours, apparently, um, because we still have more to talk about. But I love that everyone was here. Thanks for being tuning into the podcast. Please click subscribe on the things and leave a rating and encourage people to listen if you feel so moved. And I love you. Thanks for being here. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. This was so awesome. You're so great. It was an honor to be here.